<laughs> Good morning, everyone. So lovely to have you here. Uh, I saw my favorite one already uh, from Vicky, who says hello from the the Jubilee line, <laughs> which is amazing. Uh, so good morning, everyone. So, so lovely to have you here. As Vicky has done, and as so many of you are doing right now, uh, please do pop in the chat feature where you're watching from. Uh, it's so lovely to see uh, folks tuning in from around the world. We've got Alina in Naples, uh, and we've got Sarah in Devon, uh, Jade in Colchester, Emma in Brighton, we've got Armenia, which is ridiculous. Uh, so hello from Little Downham outside of Cambridgeshire. In fact, we're both broadcasting from Cambridgeshire this morning, uh, both Tom and I, so that's cool. Um, don't forget, however, very, very important uh, to switch your chat messages to everyone. So the way that you're going to do that is that you can see it in the chat feature uh, on the right hand side. Uh, and it says uh, your type message here. And above there, it says two. Some of you right now will have that two hosts and panelists. You need to switch that to everyone so that everyone can see your message uh, this morning. We'd love to keep that chat going throughout the duration of today's session. It's so, so, so special. Ian just said, He's listening in the shower. That's way too much information, uh, but let's go. <laughs> so uh, as ever, I'm going to level two challenges at you uh, this morning. The first is to do exactly what you're doing right now and uh, keep that chat feature buzzing throughout the duration of today's session. Um, it's, it's, it's honestly so important. You know, like, I mean, Tom and I will do our best to provide a bunch of information, but we're here for you. So, you know, like, have take the opportunity to listen say hello and be positively lovely to one another say hello that's part of the point of being here live secondly i really really appreciate it and honestly you guys smashed it last week uh by sharing your biggest takeaway from today's session on linkedin twitter or instagram uh just let people know what you learned today uh, that's how this community grows but it's also a lovely opportunity for you to sort of say hello to the rest of the community outside of uh outside of the session i'm being very distracted by some people saying is this a new trend marketing meter collaborations with the shower uh no it's not uh, let's not go there <laughs> um so if all that sounds good let's get on with today's session uh so today we have tom roach who's the vp of brand planning at jellyfish tom first came to my attention uh, after mark ritson last week's guest uh shout him out uh, shouted him out and sang his praises on linkedin since then, I've followed a smart, interesting, thoughtful human who is a genuine industry leader. And, and you only need to see the, um, the LinkedIn comments when we announced the season lineup and then again yesterday to know that people think an awful lot of Tom. Um, and that's also evidenced through his multiple gold IPA effectiveness, uh, effectiveness awards, uh, which is awesome. Uh, I guess to paraphrase, you know, the things that come from Tom's brain fingers and mouth are all worth listening to. He's a seriously impressive human. So yes, I'm really, really pleased to see here today. And I think we're going to have a lot of fun uh, as that chat feature is going. And I love Jemima saying that her mood has improved already. So uh, today we'll run as a presentation and then a Q&A afterwards. So make sure to make the most of that Q&A feature. The way you do that is you hover, hover your mouse uh, and you'll see a Q&A feature down the bottom. Pop your questions in there as we go throughout today's session. Uh, that will enable us to get those questions in to you. Before we get started, I want to say a big thank you to today's sponsor, who are Third Light. Uh, who, great news about the Third Light, they've just been acquired uh, by a company called Photo Shelter, uh, who are based over in the States. Third Light, running with the Cambridgeshire theme, are also actually uh, based in Cambridgeshire, about five miles down the road from me. A lovely team and they do uh they do damn software so they help people organize their digital assets in a way that makes sense their clients include people like royal albert hall as roma uh, and some ridiculous people for a company based in cambridge that makes me a little bit proud so check out third light they're so so lovely and they've always treated us like family since day one i also want to say a big thanks to hrefs impression content cal fiverr redgate cambridge marketing college Brand Recruitment, Gravity Global. Uh, we'll feature all of those in additional weeks over the course of time. So uh, that's my introduction done. Thank you all for already setting the chat featured uh, light. Uh, please continue throughout the duration. And uh, Tom, it's, uh, it's over to you. Thank you so much, Joe, for um, 
just a lovely, lovely intro and just a lovely atmosphere that I can just see you create with this, these meetups. It's, um, I, it's, it feels like a really special community you've got going here, which is quite extraordinary given the numbers. So um, I guess, yeah, th thanks for that. Um, I wanted to, to, to talk about this. So in a world of change, what won't? Um, I, I won't introduce myself and, and Jellyfish. Um, you, sounds like some of you read some of the blog and, and I'm on Twitter a bit. Um, but normally just sharing the blog, so that's probably a bit pointless. Um, so that's me, I get the sort of brand messaging up front as per sort of best practice. But I wanted to talk about how marketers are obsessed with what's changing and what's new, but actually it's the things that will never change that are often far more powerful for our brands and their growth, and we ignore those at our peril. I'm going to explore some of the fundamentals that shape and will always shape the best, most effective marketing communication. So this is a whistle stop tour of the unchanging fundamentals, starting with the parts of the human brain um, formed around 150 million years ago, which govern our emotions, our motivations and our memories. Uh, and then I'll look a bit at the work of Daniel Kahneman on system one and system two thinking, which will probably be familiar to, to many of you, and also the work of Byron Sharp and others on how, on how brand building communication is needed to exploit to the maximum how our lazy, instinctive um, brains work. So in 2019, Jeff Bezos made a brilliant case for businesses to focus less on the things that change and more on the things that won't. He said, I very frequently get the question, what's going to change in the next 10 years? And that is a very interesting question. It's a very common one. I almost never get the question, what's not going to change in the next 10 years? And I submit to you that that question is uh, actually the more important of the two, because you can build a business strategy around the things that are stable in time. And in the 60s, um, advertising legend Bill Burnback made essentially the same plea. So well over a century, half a century before Bezos. He said, it took millions of years for man's instincts to develop. It will take millions more for them to, to even vary. It is fashionable to talk about changing man. A communicator must be concerned with the unchanging man, with his obsessive drive to survive, to be admired, to succeed, to love, to take care of his own. So two brilliant minds and two frequently cited quotes saying the same thing, but still we obsess with the new. And as ever, the brilliant Mark Tunis just sums it up um, perfectly in a cute little cartoon there. Because in marketing, we're obsessed with change and with the technology that will deliver that change. And of course, this is really important. I'm a huge believer in the power of technology combined with the best of human creativity and imagination to grow brands. I think it may be because we're in the business of growth, of changing businesses, and we confuse that end with the means and believe it means we should only use new and changing technologies to achieve the change and growth that we require. But for today, let's ask ourselves this. What are the unchanging fundamentals of marketing communication that will always be true, regardless of the technologies we use to exploit them? So surely I'm going to share seven of those key things. But first, let's talk about the most important uh, part of the unchanging man that shapes those fundamentals, the human brain. And more specifically, the brain's limbic system, which is now um, something like 150 million years old. It's shared with all of our mammalian and um, reptilian ancestors. It's involved with our primitive physical and emotional drives with pleasure and pain, things like thirst, hunger, sexuality. It's the center of our motivation, memory, emotions, and governs our decision-making. But without oversimplifying things too much, I'm sure a real neuroscientist would, 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 would think this is oversimplification. When some kind of external stimulus is received that's strong enough, a signal will be sent to the central nervous system. The brain then cross-references this message with information already stored in the brain to determine the appropriate behavioral response. And the cells that fire together, wire together. This is an old neuroscience saying that means the more you receive a particular stimulus, the stronger the memories stored in your synapses become. So over time, consistent distinctive stimulus changes the cells in our brains, creating a network of associated memories and ideas which act to inform our behaviors. And Kahneman called this the associative memory. 
So a strong brand really is an actual thing in our brain, an associative network of memories and ideas. The, the work of Daniel Kahneman also outlined the two systems of thinking that then govern our behavior and decision-making in relation to the stimuli we receive. He talks about system one, system two thinking. Human decision-making is determined by two decision-making systems, quick, intuitive, automatic, lazy, effortless system one thinking governs the vast majority of our behavior and decision-making and slower, more conscious, more deliberative, more effortful thinking in our system two, which is responsible for only a tiny minority of our decision-making. Some people say it's 95 to 5%. It's really hard to make really specific, accurate um, uh, kind of data driven um, perspectives on the amount. But the vast, vast majority is this is instinctive, um, effortless, lazy um, decision making. So many of us uh, think that we are thinking creatures that feel, but we're actually feeling creatures that think, as uh, neuroscientist Jill Bolt Taylor said. So here's a little fun little exercise that I won't be able to hear answers, unfortunately, or maybe you'll see them if I had the chat function on. Which brain scan shows someone choosing their favorite brand and which shows the same person choosing another brand? Well, the answer is the right. Um, people normally say the left, but actually, because system one decisions are no brainers, they're automatic with little cognitive effort. So strong brands become shortcuts. Most people choose the left brain that shows more hotspots of neural activity, where actually it's the reverse, the right brain with fewer hotspots of activity. You want your, your brand to be a no brainer. We need to make our brands no brainers. And ultimately people buy products and services to meet their goals and brands need to become easy, quick shortcuts to those goals. This is a useful wheel I've borrowed from Phil Barden at Decode Marketing, which shows the core human needs that brands need to enable for us. So brands help us have something like security or a loving family, do something like thrill-seeking behaviors, or be or become something, i.e. being becoming admired or respected. And the stronger the associations between your brand and the consumer's goals in your category, the higher the perceived value of your brand. So overall, what we learn from our unchanging human brain is create powerful stimuli, evoke emotional reactions, build consistent associations, create mental networks um, and target consumer goals in relation to the category you're in, all of which will, will help you become an instinctive, easy choice. But how do we do that? So I've got seven key principles of great communication. You could call them seven atomic particles of communication, but that would be really pretentious. Um, so let's just call them the, the fundamental building blocks, seven principles of effective communication. And, the, and those in, in my mind are these reach, attention, creativity, distinctiveness, consistency, emotion, and motivation. The first one, reach. <clears throat> so one of, um, Marketing's fundamental laws is this. Uh, it's that brands grow by driving penetration. You'll have heard this, I'm sure, on the meetup from different people previously. Um, and I've stolen this particular graphic from Vima Snyders, who's a, a, a brilliant guy, who's a real Byron Sharp um, junkie. So brands grow by driving penetration, bringing in new customers, um, and market share is strongly correlated with penetration. So getting customers to buy your brand once in a given buying cycle, getting them from zero purchases to one is always more important than driving even more frequency with heavy customers. The marketing laws related to this are outlined in Byron Sharp's seminal book, How Brands Grow. I mean, every marketer should read that. Uh, I think only 14% of UK marketers, senior UK marketers have done. So just reading it is an advantage. In fact, a marketer believing they can grow their brand by driving loyalty from existing fans is like a physicist not believing in gravity. It breaks one of the few actual scientific laws of marketing. So the first fundamental um, of marketing communication is that you're going to need to reach loads of people who are buyers of your category 
but are probably just not that into you. They're not your fans. They're not spending any time thinking about you. They have lazy, instinctive lizard brains, which need powerful stimuli to get them to react. It's worthwhile remembering this. Your brand's health depends on lots of people who don't know you well, don't think of you much, and don't buy you often, if at all. It's the light buyers in your category, in every category, who are surprisingly important to brand growth. Heavy buyers will notice and buy you any, anyway. So we have to step outside of our marketing bubbles and realize that most people don't care much about brands or your brand, and most people spend no time, or almost no time thinking about them, apart from in those moments when they're making a decision in relation to a purchase, which is all you know, very, very rare. So regardless of how technology changes our abilities to target people, reaching beyond existing heavy buyers will always be essential. So remember your most important audience isn't nearly as obsessed about your products as you are and don't just speak to existing fans. Which brings us on to the second principle, you're gonna to need to attract the attention of the uninterested. Now ad clutter, exists everywhere, on our streets, on our screens. It's a major problem anywhere there are eyeballs and advertising is paying for the content people are consuming. But if you're tempted to think that a need to grab attention through ad clutter is a modern problem, think again, it, here's a painting from 1874 called Modern Advertising, a railway station. To me, it actually resembles a, you know, a, a modern publisher's site with, with tons of ads, none of which are really attracting your attention, all are just kind of cluttering up the environment and making it look pretty ugly. And then you know, it's a replication of one. And here's one of my favorite pieces of attention grabbing communication from the last couple of years. It's from KFC, obviously in the UK a couple of years ago after a crisis when they ran out of chicken and had to win back customers who'd previously been, um, who'd been seriously annoyed by the experience of them failing to deliver on their kind of number one promise you know, to have chicken. It was an inspired way to draw attention to a message that was really just another corporate apology. Um, it, I mean, you know, most brands would simply have had a published a letter from the CEO with the word sorry in it, a big um, and just looking like a corporate apology. They didn't. And thank, thank fuck for that. And it really did help them recover from their crisis. Of course, what this also did, it was published in, in, in newsprint, but it used everything social um, to, to, to get attention and, and get, get the reach, the extra reach it needed. And I think the, it was an interesting com combination actually of print and social, which I think is quite a, quite, quite a cool thing to do. And quite, um, you know, obviously lots of brands try and do that. Twitter recently with their out of home stuff, which is looking amazing, I think. Attention looks like it's finally getting uh, the attention it deserves with, with attention measurement tools becoming available and the potential for user as a media currency is, look, is being looked at by people. Not without its problems, I suspect. Karen, Professor Karen Nelson Field is leading the way here. And whilst it's early days, I think the attention age appears to be dawning. Which brings us to our third principle, creativity. Creativity is repeatedly found to be the strongest driver of advertising profitability and sales over and above media and targeting by loads of different studies, including by the IPA. But, but what is creativity? I, I love this definition of creative ideas by Faris Yaakov, strategist, which reminds us that pure originality doesn't really exist and isn't actually necessary. Um, apparently new ideas are always recombinations of existing ideas. And that uh, definition reminds me of, um, it has echoes of this really timeless, actually legal definition of innovation from the US Patent Office which to me is the essence of, of creativity. Novelty is important, I think, because it's, it, it means something surprising, non-obvious makes it interesting. Useful is important because it means your creativity has an actual purpose and is relevant to the job at hand. And I love this particular piece of creativity. It's like 40 years old now. Uh, BBH, the agency's first ever ad for Black Levi's, um, because it incorporates one of the most evergreen rules of creativity and how it works. It exploits a thing called a psychological law of creativity called the von Resthoff effect, which is the power of contrast. Um, if you read out a list of things, an item in that list, which is discontinuous, doesn't fit, is original, 
is different to, to the other things in that list will stand out and get attention and be more memorable than the rest of those things. And this is a just a little a little example of that from a psychological paper on the von Resthoff effect. Um, so the list on the left, rabbit, finch, briefcase, dog, the word briefcase is more memorable because it's discontinuous. It shouldn't be there, it doesn't fit. And the data on the right is um, brain, activity, sorry, brain activity from another uh, psychology paper, which shows brain activity peaking on the word socks when that slightly odd sentence is read out to respondents. So turtles are not as smart as mammals such as socks or dogs. That's when the brain begins to go, oh, that doesn't compute what's going on. And it reinforces um, and it gets attention and reinforces the, the, the message of, that's being uh, and drives engagement for the message that's being delivered. And yet there is so much sameness today. Um, one small example, um, at BBH Labs, we counted 27 end lines that were structured in this format, find your X. This was 2018, I think there'll be more since then. Um, so it's, it's, it's crazy that, that, that given the importance of creativity, so often we just revert to, to what's easy and familiar. And it's, you know, I guess the, the time, we don't all have time to, 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 to spend push, pushing ourselves and coming to the next idea and the next idea. But if we just allow the first idea through, we'll often just end up with something as predictable as this. And you can find a, a sea of, a similar sea of sameness in every category. This was uh, mobile phones advertising in, I think a couple of years ago, you know, really, you know, everything looking the same, every brand not, not standing out. Apparently it was the rules at the time that you had to have a big phone on a black background with a really boring headline with, with some mix of letters and numbers in it. Um, and making up, by the way, making a sea of sameness like this is a brilliant trick for persuade. If you've got an organization or a team that needs to push themselves, be more creative. It's a great trick. Works in every single category. Just get all the work, the advertising, the communication, the websites, whatever, from your category, stick it on one board. And it instantly just says, we need to stand out. You know, the, you, you can't do anything other than conclude you need to, to be distinctive uh, from, from seeing your category like that. So I want to use this as a platform, really, so as a rallying cry to say, let's stop putting our work through the modern marketing wind tunnel because it's leading to too much sameness. Which leads us really neatly onto the fourth principle here, distinctiveness. Another key pillar of the work of Byron Sharp and the Ehrenberg Bass Institute is to talk about the need to create networks of memory structures for our brands so they come to mind more easily in buying moments as we've already seen from how the brain creates associative networks. So the primary task for all communications is to build and refresh memory structures. These structures improve the chance of a brand being recalled first in buying situations. And that's the critical thing. If somebody's in your category, they're making a decision, they think of your brand first. If your brand comes to mind first, um, that will confer on it certain qualities. People will think it's popular, better, better quality, um, more, more famous, more likely to do the job at hand. Put really simply, we need to make our brands easy to mind and easy to find. And distinctive brand assets are the devices and mechanisms which help create the memory structures that are the frame of reference that is stored in the brain in those associative networks that help brands come to mind first and get chosen. Having a strong set of distinctive brand assets results in a brand looking like itself. Again, this is Byron Sharp. Too often we think of um, branding meaning the logo or a product image when really it, it, it means, does this communication look like your brand? When looking, when judging a piece of creative work, Try and be objective. Look at it. Does this look like us? Does this look like our brand? Not is the logo big enough? Is the headline big enough? Is the brand name big enough? That's kind of irrelevant. It's the totality. Does the brand, is it recognizably us? I think McDonald's is probably one of the best examples of a brand that nails this every time. Every single campaign across markets, they just know what they're doing when it comes to their brand assets and what they're building. It has a really wide um, set of iconic assets, uh, products, um, uh, visual identity, imagery, that kind of stuff. Um, and it draws on all of this stuff for communication and plays, plays with these assets and codes in everything it does. Here are a couple of recent examples um, from the UK. 
Um, but yeah, you can see it, see it, you know, all around the world in, in campaigns that they do. Um, there's another another brilliant, brilliant piece of work um, that they've done. But one often forgotten principle is that in order to be truly distinctive and recognizable as yourself, you do also need to be consistent. It's not enough to create a series of unconnected fireworks. We see this in the Cannes Awards and other award shows every year from so many brands. You need to find fresh but highly branded ways to communicate essentially the same message or messages. Um, in order to strengthen and reinforce the brand memories in our synapses. So you need to be consistently distinctive in your communication. There's another, another bit of great work from the UK from McDonald's. So consistency um, is the fifth principle. And again, here's Byron Sharp on the topic. You cannot be distinctive if you are not consistent. I think it's sometimes confusing the words distinctive and consistent because I, I suspect people, and I'm, I'm one of them, sometimes comes to the word distinctive and think, thinks it only means cut through or um, you know, impact. Actually, it means recognizability. Does, do you look like yourself? And you need to consistently deliver that over time. And consistency is, is proven to be more profitable than inconsistency. In fact, um, we, did, we did a thing um, on, it was Weetabix in the UK for an IPA effectiveness case study. And we looked at, with, with, um, with the Econometrics Agency Ubiquity, we looked at a whole bunch of campaigns, long what we called long running distinctive brand campaigns. And they tended to have ROIs about 60% above the average compared to brands that were doing inconsistent things. And that is because if you, it, it, the second or third or, or fourth burst of a campaign will, will nearly always have a higher ROI than the first um, because people are not coming it to, com to it completely fresh. It's building on uh, the brand recognition that came before. So you're not going back to zero in terms of, of, a, of, of brand, brand um, recognizability from the start, you're building on something. So to our sixth, um, nearly there, sixth, sixth principle, uh, emotion. Now, a lot of nonsense is talked about emotion. Um, I think people tend to assume it means emotional narrative storytelling in TV or film. Um, but, you know, people can have an emotional response to any channel, any format of any length. If you saw a banner ad for a supermarket that said half price champagne, people would likely have a strong emotional and behavioral reaction. I know I would. So seemingly rational inputs like half price champagne can have, hand, can have an emotional outcome. So, but we're talking about people, sorry, people talking about rational versus emotional ads and always try and think about emotion as a consumer response, not an executional input. Consumer outcome, not an executional input. Um, emotion, in communication has a really wide variety of benefits. Communications that evoke emotion, um, emotional responses have better attention, they keep and retain uh, people's attention better. Uh, people process the content more deeply and accurately. They then have better memory encoding and memory retrieval in decision-making moments. So emotion is, is really, really a powerful tool or, um, in, in communication. It's something that you ignore at your peril. This is the classic piece of data that supports emotion by Les Burnett and Peter Field from the long and the short of it, another absolute seminal work um, from their analysis of the IPA data bank, which said that emotional campaigns are almost twice as likely to achieve top, top box profit performance as rational campaigns. I think sometimes this looks a bit like the thing I've just said, which is trying to define ca campaigns by emotional or rational, but it's the best evidence we've got at the moment that emotional, or some of the best evidence we've got, that emotional responses creates more, more, and more profit for our brands. On to the final uh, point, motivation. So we've just seen that ads that evoke emotional responses have better attention, deeper processing of the content, better memory encoding and retrieval. But it's important to say that the emotion itself is not what motivates people. There has to be something in the brand uh, in, the, in there that, that the brand is helping you to achieve. So the famously emotional John Lewis Christmas campaign in the UK works because of the double whammy of emotional response and motivation. It, it, it 
cuts through and delivers emotion in spades, in the storytelling, in the characters, etc. cetera. Um, but it also shows that John Lewis shoppers are thoughtful gifters. The thoughtful gifters part is actually the bit that's doing the emotional, mo sorry, the motivational part of the communication. So there is a difference or can be a difference between the emotion evoked in a piece of communication, for example, like a retail bank making a funny ad to get your attention, and the emotional goal you're promising your brand will achieve. For example, that brand could also be um, promising at the same time that it's that it's safer, more secure, uh, more reassuring place to keep your money. Those two things are not necessarily inconsistent, but they can, they they are often different. So to wrap up, um, great communication helps brands be noticed, come easily to mind, be thought worth it, and those seven principles are key levers to achieving those goals. And when you look at that first McDonald's campaign I showed, you see that despite it being one visual, two words, two colors, um, all seven principles are present and correct here. Reach, attention, creativity, distinctiveness, consistency, emotion, and motivation. So there it is, one unchanging piece of communications hardware, the brain, and seven unchanging principles of effective marketing communication that can get that hardware working for your brand. So with that, thank you very much. I hope you found that useful um, and I'm sure there are uh, tons of questions. Awesome, Tom. Thank you so much, my friend. There is a bunch of questions and uh, you've had a bunch of praise come through throughout the duration. In fact, if you've got that chat feature open right now, <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of really really lovely uh things being said right now so uh i hope you can see that because uh i mean honestly like thank you to everyone in the community as well because uh you know that that chat feature is a, a rare thing actually to sort of see that ticker as it is wow. so um, I'm aware there was a ton of stuff there um the really simple way to absorb that is probably just to read the um the, the blog post which covers most of it or all of it actually absolutely we'll we'll, we'll send that out as well in the uh, in the follow-up email straight away after the uh, after this session um but we do have time <laughs> for questions all bit um if i can stop laughing at how amazing uh the uh the uh, the, the chat feature is uh we're going to take these uh from the q a feature by the way so um for everyone watching do take the time to to go through the open questions there's 15 open questions right now um and and i've got some of my own as well make sure to give a thumbs up to the questions that you would uh, love to be asked uh first because uh, we've, we've got a little bit of time, but it would be great to make sure that we prioritise those that you really, really love. And also make sure to sort of go right through to the bottom as well, because uh, there's some brilliant questions in there as well that just were asked later on. Uh, so so there we go. So, uh, in fact, the first question, Tom, uh, comes from uh, Anonymous, the mysterious Anonymous. Um, and, and, and they ask, um, they sort of ask this question about halfway through the presentation. So you did actually give some examples further on. Um, but let's let's ask it nonetheless, which is the examples you you're mostly giving at that point were e-commerce based. Uh, can you think of a service brand that has demonstrated that uh, ingenuity, creativity and originality in the same way? Um, gosh, service brand that does it. Hmm. Uh, depends, I guess it depends what you mean by service brand. I, mm. I mean, I think um, I, I think one of the the. I don't know if it's a service brand, but Virgin Media, I think, is really consistently distinctive in its communication, knows its tone of voice. In fact, a load of the Virgin brands historically have been brilliant at, at knowing who they are, being recognisably themselves in the, in the way they speak, um, getting a really good balance between uh, freshness and familiarity and, and, and um, just kind of reinventing themselves when, when necessary. But but using their brand assets and building them in a, in a, in a, in a pathway and then activating them in, in sales activation work. Um, mm -hmm. So if that counts as a service brand, but yeah. 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 No, that sounds about right. And, and, and Siobhan has sort of said just eat could potentially be a, a service brand as well. Um, Dean has sort of said British airways, I guess it comes back to everything you've sort of said about that sort of consistency and, and reinvention and, and, and creativity. Um, one of the questions that sort of, as we're speaking about industries and stuff like that, it's always the question that you're going to get in any sort of marketing presentation ever, you know, which is for these smaller brands that don't necessarily have the opportunity or B2B brands that might be a little bit more quote unquote boring. Um, I don't actually believe that, but I'm going to ask the question. Also, 
pro Sorry, move I... pro move being the dog the dog in <laughs> at this point um you know is is that sort of same repetition um possible for those brands in the same way i mean is it is it <laughs> Jade, just, right. for, just for smaller brands yeah I, I i i mean of course it is and it's even more important i suspect there might be a thing when you're small and you're growing you're still trying to experiment you're still trying to find your voice mm-hmm. um that makes it harder um because you've got less history to fall back on you know you don't have the big mac and the filio fish and the milkshakes and all those existing assets to, to rely on you're actually creating assets and that's that's really hard um, and sometimes you need to junk things and, and move on. So I bet you there are there are other challenges that come into play. I mean, every every size of brand has its challenges, but I think these rules are are, um, are timeless and 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 work regardless of category or or size of brand. Mm-hmm. Awesome. And and with that in mind, then we were discussing before about how a lot of brands are starting to be built around people, you know, and 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 rather than sort of companies presumably the same theories apply uh, for sort of quote unquote well, personal brands as much as completely. they do. And you only have to look at, I mean, the, 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 I guess the most um, uh, controversial example is probably Trump and Boris, actually, mm-hmm. you, you know, one of the, one of the charts I often show distinct to brand assets has, you know, has, has a load of logos and it has Trump's hair. And unfortunately when it, when it comes to, to, to personal branding, the same kind of rules apply and, and 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 essentially if you have a really powerful set of assets they can um, work in your favor in, in getting you chosen at those key moments regardless of the of the, the the whether it's a good thing or not so you know i i suspect really strong assets can even help brands that aren't too great um, and they can they can be a bit of a kind of security blanket if your products are so strong. But then brands have always worked that way. Brands have always had a sort of protective layer um, that helps you as a uh, as a product or a service, um, in, uh, e- even if your quality isn't so strong. Of course, you need you need you'll get found out eventually, um, and you need to be a, 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 a you know quality quality product in order to, to to get your brand reputation working properly but it can be a bit of a cushion, I suspect. Interesting. And on, on that point and following that thread, um, you know, given your role and it's less about what you spoke about, but more as you're a brand guy, you know, are you looking towards a future where there are more brands based around people um, than sort of logos or is there a time that's, that's more appropriate, less appropriate? I don't know. You mean, you mean product brands and, that are based around people or people yeah. brands that are based around people? Um, both really. So, I mean, product brands, I guess, is the, the, the question really in that those brands were traditionally uh, sort of h- hidden behind a logo and mm. that was what represented it. But um, do you see a future where, you know, sort of more people are the front and center and actually the, the logo is second? I, I mean, I, I think um, all brands need a rich set of really strong brands will will have a rich and wide and diverse set of assets which can include people and will usually include logos. I, I, I'm, I'm kind of agnostic about the types of thing. I think most brands, you know, there are, there are obvious things that all brands need. You need a name, you need to be, you need something to, 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 to be called normally. You need a logo, mm-hmm. um, you need a visual identity. You might use people or, or um, you know, I think one of the problems with using people is that you want really as a brand, you want uh, freehold assets, not leasehold assets. It's a classic mm-hmm. phrase that um, Sir Nigel Bogle used to use at BBH. You want to own your thing mm-hmm. and you can't own the people normally and they will move on unless you're Richard Branson and Virgin. Uh, but, even, but even that brand, you know, has, has a history of trying to work out what, the role of Richard Branson in that in their brand armory. So I think you need to be a bit careful about about time pegging yourselves to a particular person unless you're you know, unless you're Jordan. Yeah. Interesting. And I guess that's probably you know just thinking out loud that's probably why people have like mascots you know so mcdonald's had you know ronald mcdonald for so long and, and stuff like that because they don't leave they are quite owned. yeah that is a, that's a great example of a leasehold asset sorry freehold asset of course then weird things started happening with you know how people felt yeah. about clowns and kids parties and and those kinds of things so they they then need to distance themselves from from that asset uh, so you know be, be be careful what you what you intend to create as an asset 
Interesting. That that's fascinating, actually, because of course there was that study that showed that those assets are uh, mascots are really, really, really powerful in terms yeah. of surveillance, right? And and so actually, I think I mean System One. I don't know if you know the, the research company System One, they talk about uh, fluent devices. Is there like a proprietary name for brand assets? I'm not sure we need the the phrase fluent, fluent, fluent devices when we've got uh, brand assets, they have a particular view that characters can be particularly powerful. I kind of think it's true, I, but I think there's a whole wide, you know, really wide variety of other assets that you can that you can use. I think, I think characters can be useful in a more narrative uh, based communication um, and visual communication. And, and actually, God, if we think about what's gonna happen with the metaverse and how when things go virtual, I imagine characters are gonna become uh, even more powerful uh, and even more used by brands. That's that's an interesting area that I hadn't yeah. thought of yet. Yeah, that's interesting. And and Nicole brings up a great point in the chat feature here about as annoying as it is, the the go compare opera singer is iconic, and it is that is that. Basically, you know, he he's um he, he follows me on Twitter. It's he's my <laughs> most famous Twitter follower. It's Win Evans, and he is a genuine opera singer. And you know he's but it's interesting how they've they started out with some very annoying advertising. Um, using him as an, an Italian, a fake Italian opera singer. And now they're trying to get a bit more modern with him and use, use him as a real human being, a Welsh guy who's genuinely um, a kind of normal person. So you can see them flexing that asset in interesting ways. Um, I think he'll always be part of, part of the brand. They can't get rid of it. The, the singing is, is a powerful mnemonic device that is, that, is, that, that, that is just too efficient for them to ever ditch, I think. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's interesting as well. I mean, so I know that um, Mark Ritson sort of has that sort of don't start messing with things. Uh, the KFC is an example that you brought up in your presentation. You know, he sort of said that they've earned the right to mess with the, the KFC because they've been doing it for so long, you know, and, 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 and yeah, it depends on what you mean. I mean, I, I, I don't, I, I don't know what the phrase earned the right to really means. I mean, basically it means it's memorable and people know it so you can, you can play with it, you know, mm. I mean, I, I actually worked on the KFC brand at a time when they had ditched finger licking good, which seems insane. Um, and I worked on Weetabix when they had ditched, have you had your Weetabix? You know, brands um, so often erroneously make this dumb mistake. New CMO comes in, wants to change up everything. They ditch the famous thing that they have. And you do that at your peril. I mean, the, the, there's a classic example that Phil Barden talks about in his book, um, Decode, uh, the science behind why we buy, uh, where Tropicana ditched their, some of their iconic uh, packaging assets and sales dropped off a cliff the next day when the packaging was changed. Because people, really simple, people couldn't recognize the bottle anymore. You know? mm -hmm. So it's not, I think we get very um, pseudo sciencey and, and kind of, um, we talk a lot of nonsense about what brands mean. And often it's just having some things that people recognize um, and and can can recognize you by and choose you by. That's all that a lot of this stuff is really about. The the, the kind of voodoo around brand meaning is is um, I think we we talk a lot of nonsense around sometimes. And really, the first job is just to be remembered for something, <laughs> anything, so long as it relates to the category. I love that. <laughs> I think that that you know that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. You know, it's nice. It's nice to have a bit of reality check uh, every so often. Uh, there's such, there's a load of phenomenal uh, comments coming through in the chat feature as well. So it really adds into this conversation. So I just want to say thank you to everyone and thank you for adding to that as well. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, let's let's make sure that we're taking some questions from the community as well. Um, so the next one uh, is is the top question uh, that has been asked. Um, I think this is as much a personal experience thing as, as much as anything uh, here, Tom. So uh, the question comes in once again from Anonymous. Uh, no one's exposing themselves today to the community, but that's fine. Uh, so uh, I work in a family run business, uh, both B2B and B2C uh, with a strong, uh, that's how we've always done it attitude. Um, the managerial roles are male. And as a woman, I regularly feel like I'm not taken seriously, even with the results marketing now provides. Some of these, uh, we've always done it, are the complete opposite to marketing staples that we should be following and that you mentioned today. Uh, how would you address the internal weakness of the companies uh, of, of the company without being brushed off? So, you know, how, how do you sort of start getting to take a little bit more seriously, I think? And that's on a personal level, I think, as much as anything. Yeah. 
Um, God, it's a very particular set of circumstances that I've not experienced myself. And having been agency side, I've often been protected from some of that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I uh, Ritson is very good at answering questions like this in a way that I'm just not. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to. How would you? How would you go about stopping that? This is this is how we've always done it. Mm-hmm. It's really I just hard. don't know. I think I think I think it does have to be on a personal basis. I mean, what one of you know a sort of parallel example is so often marketers are trying to to, to persuade CFOs to spend money on on brand investment, for example, and brand advertising, and they go late. They go they go in with a, a very logical, rational argument with all the data and the charts, and actually they miss the human side of 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 the story, and they miss and, and there's, there's there have to be ways I think to build personal relationships with with those characters that are um that are that are um saying these things and, and being a bit of a block so i think it has to start on a um on a on a per- personal relationship side of things understanding everybody's goals trying to unpick the issues that people have um i mean i, I probably fundamentally there'll be there'll be fears that somebody's coming in and trying to change things and this this has always worked for us so so why shouldn't it carry on working i bet you there's common ground that can be found around you know what one of the things that um uh, i was always taught was that if you want to make your brand great go back to what made it great in the first place so really dig into the brand do some brand archaeology understand the history and the essence of it and the essence of how it's how it grew and how it how it connected with consumers and what it was for and i bet you somewhere in that kernel of of the truth, the essence of the truth about the brand will be common ground that can take you forward. Find common ground. I like that. No, I, I think that goes into a lot of uh, marketers' experiences of, you know, I mean, we've, got, we've actually got a talk later in, in uh, this season about sort of uh, marketing to the internal company and, and sort of getting them on board. And I, I think you're spot on, you know, I think we, as marketers, you know, and obviously I can't speak to to the sort of being a, a woman in a male company uh, element of it but as a more general sort of marketing thing then um, you know it is about finding that common ground and getting that understanding isn't it you know and folks sort of come on board and, and I think Jay Kunzo sort of said something uh, recently in, in a recent webinar which was you know taking them on that journey so if you can find folks who can sort of get that nugget of common ground exactly as you said uh, and take them on that journey from that point then hopefully that will help but I'd love in the in the chat feature if you've got any suggestions, because uh, as well, because you know we're here to help each other. It's, yeah. it's just Tom it and I. It sounds like a like a, a situa- particular situation that needs like you you need you need people that have actually been there and done that and and, and real examples of how they've worked around that issue. Because yeah, I, I I can't offer that Absolutely. advice. I'm afraid mentorship, allies. Absolutely spot on. Cool. Uh, so we've got a question here from Phil. I'm going to uh, move past the first one at the top here because uh, I think we've spoken about a version of that already. Uh, so we've got a question here from Phil, which is, uh, which emotional triggers do you believe have the greatest effect on people's behaviours? And uh, I also oh, go to love and hate, you know, and, and sort of being those two, but you're actually a lot more educated than that. So. ones, aren't they? <laughs> Um, I'm trying to channel my Phil Barden, which emotions, uh, it depends on the category. So, so some categories are all about safety and reassurance. So banking, finance and control and, 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 and people wanting kind of control and certainty over an uncertain future. Um, some categories are all about fun and excitement. I'm sure some categories are about sex. Some, some categories are about, about sort of satiating, you know, hunger. And so I think it really depends on the category. Um, in terms of the fundamental motivational um, emotional needs and goals that people have um, but then when you come to if I was splitting out you know the communication sides of what emotions you want to trigger there's a lot of evidence that that surprise um, and, and, and hilarity and humor are really powerful communications devices to get attention and keep, keep attention and drive memory um, and I've, there's been a lot of talk recently, hasn't there, around that the the decline in humour, in use of humour in, in communication may, I'm not sure why that is, it's probably a global thing, um, but that I, I, I think um, be, be really surprising and probably try and make people laugh and be entertaining is probably generally quite good advice, regardless of the category, um, I'd say. <laughs> yeah. from, from, from the creative people I know, that they, they kind of, 
rail against the fact that those things are in decline. So it probably is a safe bet that those things are actually quite powerful. And, and you'll be you'll stand out even more if you are really, really funny. Hard to do, though. Yeah, absolutely. Extreme, extreme intense emotions. I skip past one slide, actually. Intense, positive emotions are the things that you want to go for. So hil- be hilarious is is, a, is probably quite a good uh, get, or be awesome. You know, get, get, get impossible to follow advice though, right? <laughs> no, I love it. Um, I know that So Dave Harland is a really great example of that yeah. on LinkedIn. Um, yeah, yeah. He's just got funny bones, you know, and, and, yeah. and he's built a phenomenal audience off the back yeah. of it. Um, and, and you know, his copywriting business on the side will, will do exactly the same, you know, uh, off, you know. Uh, love dave i love the fact that he absolutely knows who he is and knows his tone of voice and plows his own furrow and will reap the benefits from it mm-hmm. even though some people will go well that's all oh, that's too that's that's too too edgy for me but mm-hmm. you know it, it, I, I think people worry too much about brands being oh we can't we, we we can't say that it's like of course you can you know just because you're a I don't know, uh, an ISA product doesn't mean you can't be funny. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's bonkers, really. The rules that people set up around themselves and kind of self-perpetuate. Um, you know, I think, we, I think we can be looser and freer in our communication, I'm sure. So long as we're just recognisably ourselves when we do it, you can, you, can, you can build your brand that way. I like that. You know, and, and, and so I guess that is interesting because, you know, those rules that we set for ourselves, I guess, are governed by this sort of idea. So say for example, a bank, for example, you know, a bank should be serious and, and, and stuff like that. So you would stand out um, for that reason. Um, is it, I guess, you know, we're finding like the emotion that that is going to matter though, you know, cause you know, you could be funny, but you know, if that's inappropriate, then it's gonna have the opposite effect or you, you, you look like you're trying too hard, right? Or maybe is it just- I think we worry too much about these things. Much, much better just to be out there making some noise. I think we we stop ourselves by creating these these artificial rules, never actually testing. Like, you know, we say, oh, we mustn't be too funny. I've seen so many times on briefs. Um, we're a we're a we 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 like to um, create wry smiles, not belly laughs. Like, why not belly laughs? laughs? <laughs> why, would, why would you stop yourself from being a brand that can create belly laughs? That would be very powerful. Yeah. <laughs> we, you know, dry wit, not slapstick. Like, why? <laughs> I love that. I love that. Uh, that's cool. It's quite, it's quite invigorating, actually. You know, I, I, I love that. Um, you know, what's what's going to happen? The sky's not going to fall in. Sales aren't going to drop. There are very, very few cases where any kind of communication has affected um affected sales negatively just be out there doing something is is probably the first thing you need to be doing and make sure it stands for something and stands up and, and makes an impact that 99 percent of what's out there is completely forgettable and if you follow the kind of the dull rules that you've set yourself you you will continue to be wallpaper nice i love that that's the quote that, that's going that's going on the headline <laughs> um so phil says uh, tom i love all your material uh, apart from bar and sharp what other resources do you advocate we look at uh, okay yeah so so obviously the, the Byron's the, the the king of this stuff um professor karen nelson field all her stuff on attention uh, really interesting new stuff um, uh, her site, Amplified Intelligence, has um, has uh, loads of her papers and work. Dr. Grace Kite, the econometrician, brilliant example of somebody who's at the cutting edge of, of, of thinking and the science of what we do, but incredibly accessible um, stuff. Um, I'm trying to think. There's some sort of more advertising books, which I'll probably part. I really like Phil Bard and his book, Decoded. Um, there is uh, anything by Les Burnett, um, Peter Field. It's a brilliant book called How Not to Plan, which is probably more for advertising strategy people by Les and Sarah Carter from Adam and Eve DDB, which is great. Um, yeah, there's a I, there's a kind of long long book li- reading list that I could uh, maybe I'll sh- maybe I'll share it. But there's t- they tend to be more advertising even than some people here on this this meetup might be because um, that's my background. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Well, thank you for sharing that. We'll, we'll also make sure to make a note of that and um, and, and share it in the in the follow ups as well. Um, so yes, Katie, a reading list would be fab, and uh, a reading list is what you will get. Um, so there was a really interesting uh, chat that was going on while you were speaking, Tom, about uh, perfume ads, and um, yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, you're laughing already, but I mean, 
they are awful, aren't they? But I mean, <laughs> that's not the question. Um, but what was quite interesting about it was that uh, some of the conversation was about um, how do you take a TV ad, um, so something that is a visual experience, and move it into something that is a uh, you know a, a smell experience, you know, a, a different set of senses, multi sensory experience. Yeah, absolutely, and. I, so first of all, you know, I mean, it's quite an open question because I'm asking you for your experience here. But I guess secondly, you know, is there a way that folks can sort of build in that multi-sensory experience, or you know, is TV alone enough in in those in those situations? Do you just need to be remembered, and then people see it on the shelf, and then they're like, yeah, you know, that's fine. Yeah. Um, the the answer to all marketing questions is it depends. Frustratingly <laughs> and annoyingly, I'll say it depends. First of all. Uh, also, I have no personal experience of the the um, perfume category. Um, I do love it though for all its bonkersness. I love uh, what I particularly love, and Ritson's an example of this because he's worked a lot with LVMH. Per, uh, fashion brands, perfume brands, they know their brand assets, they know their distinctive assets, they know their codes, um, and people who are really into fashion can spot um, a particular fashion brand through, from the way it communicates just like that from the fact that it's got a tiger in it or a leopard or it's got a whatever um and i think that's that's a lesson that we can all learn i also love the fact that they 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 because they've got nothing to say because it is pure emotion they're not bogged down in message they're not bogged down in anything informative about their about that brand it's a bit like the, the the tobacco category in the 80s where they couldn't say anything of that was particularly motivating. So they had to go a bit surreal and meaningless and actually meaninglessness, meaningless distinctiveness is what Byron Sharp would say is more powerful than meaningful differentiation, um, which I mean, another, another argument for another day, meaningful different, differentiation is, is, is less powerful than perhaps we used to think it is. <laughs> so I love the meaninglessness and the distinctiveness of, of per perfume brands and, and fashion houses communication. And that probably shows the key to what you then do in other channels where you show up um, and how you translate your brand into other sensory experiences. Um, and yeah, you, you can only imagine the kind of bonkersness that, that, that a perfume brand would be able to, the fun that they'll be able to have in a virtual reality metaverse kind of world. <laughs> um, just just, just that, that, that's really interesting, isn't it? That when, when you're actually able to create communication that is genuinely multi-sensory and not some kind of smell vision um then i think uh, i think that that potentially is really exciting and interesting for for brands doing real 360 experiences on a mass scale because up till now brands have mostly only been able to do experiences on quite a small scale with individual you know a, a car show or a, a, a you know spraying perfume on somebody in a in a metaverse world we'll be able to be infinite in the experiences in terms of the number of people we can reach with them so that's quite interesting a much more efficient way of doing experiential marketing mm -hmm. that's, that's fascinating god yeah no you're, you're right and then actually it's so it actually strikes me as quite a pure example in the sense of of everything you've been speaking about today in, in that sense you know because they haven't had the opportunity to do the functional stuff it is more emotional brand -led. Yep. fascinating cool it's half past the time has flown uh so tom you know thank you for taking the time today and also thank you to everyone for for chipping in throughout the duration of, of today's session uh, in the chat feature in the q a honestly you all make it such a wonderful experience and i'm really really grateful for every one of you so thank you for taking the time um please do say a big thank you to uh third light i'll, I'll make sure to link at least one of their team members um in in the follow-up email please do take the time just to drop in a quick message on linkedin that makes a big big difference and also be sure to uh share your big key takeaway on uh today's session whether that's linkedin instagram or twitter um it, it really makes a big difference so uh thank you all so so much thank you tom and uh we will see you next week thanks everyone take care thanks